Well, welcome everybody. Uh, super excited to have everyone in attendance for this uh, very special day. Uh, Talks at Google and the Black Googler Network are uh, super excited to be able to welcome to the stage uh, a man that I have very copious notes that I need to refer to to make sure I hit every single awesome accolade. I'm still going to miss a ton of them. So uh, welcome to the stage a man uh, with two decades of experience, of impact in the world, and sharing his thoughts and ideas as a poet, hip-hop artist, songwriter, and actor. He's released six books and five albums and has vaulted himself onto the list of best-selling poet of all time. I'm not even sure how you do that, but you got to be pretty amazing to, to make that happen. So we're going to have a, a lot of fun tonight. Uh, some, of the, some of the performances we're going to have are selections from his book, USA, and his album, Martyr, Loser, King, uh, which my uh, personal favorite is Think Like the Books Say. I've had that on repeat um, all week. So that we might hear that later tonight. We'll see. So uh, Saul Williams has performed in over 30 countries and has read at over 300 universities with invitations that have spanned from the White House to Queen Elizabeth Hall. And he's actually just returning from a tour of Europe and will be doing uh, three nights uh, of shows here in Chicago. So I'm not sure if there's any tickets left, but uh, you can uh, try and check those out and see uh, what might be uh, still available. So it goes without saying, we're super pleased to have none other than Saul Williams joining us here today. And please welcome me and join me in giving him a, a warm welcome to the stage. President of Archaeological Indifference, Vice President of Truth, Secretary of Statistics, Minister of Celebrity and Justice, Chief of Staff and Serpent, Blessed Page Turner of the Great Book of Misdeeds and Overestimations, Bishop of the Great Climate War, Minister of the Deteriorating Sky, Baron of Epic Boredom and Self-Indulgence, All Gathered Notables, Good Afternoon. <laughs> hack into dietary sustenance, tradition versus health. Hack into comfort, compliance. Hack into the rebellious gene. Hack into doctrine, capitalism in relation to free labor and slavery. Hack into the history of the bank as beating the odds, a mere act of joining the winning team. Hack into desperation and loneliness, the history of community in the marketplace. Hack into land rights and ownership. Hack into business law, proprietorship. Hack into ambition and greed. Hack into forms of government, systems of control, the relation of suffering and sufferance. Hack into faith and morality, the treatment of one faith towards another. Hack into masculinity, femininity, sexuality, what is taught, what is felt, what is learned, what is shared. Hack into God, stories of creation, serpents and eggs. Hack into nature, biodynamics, biodiversity, cycles and seasons. Hack into time, calendars, Descartes, its relationship to doubt. Is it wired to fear, is the notion of control, the space-time continuum, the force of gravity, whether the opposite of gravity is freedom. Hacking of freedom, power, responsibility, justice, the Bill of Rights, hacking the coincidence of summer of 68, the 27 club, number of people with Facebook profiles, people choose to share, people share too much, people seem lonely, people want to connect, people want to uplift, people who need uplifting, hacking the self-help, self-sufficiency, and self-indulgence, hacking the crazy, hacking a lunatic, hacking a star, hacking the infamous, notorious, the effects of the construct of poverty on the psyche, the effects of the construct of race, the effects of cruelty, the victims that survived. There is a panel marked survival. Three simple copper wires coiled round an orb, hacking the orbit, equatorial landmines, useful and precious metals, Colton as cotton. Hacking the hazardous, nuclear, blue clear, cloud form and fish farm, cow farts and pig shit. Hacking a horse, industrial, digital, hacking a code, use your instrument as metaphor, harness your craft, hacking to the mainframe, dismantle definition, dogman duty, hacking to destiny, hacking to dream, subtext and subconscious, hacking to heart, cardio, Congo, blood rich in oil, hacking to suffering and despair. Hacking to the unfair advantages of those lucky enough to be born into one family or another, into one condition or another. Hacking to the circumstantial evidence 
existence that proves the obvious and wakes the oblivious. Hacking the birthright, bloodlines, royal and tainted. Hacking the superstition, old wives' tales, rituals of the shaman. Hacking the DNA, the pharmaceutical industry, chemistry, the, the, the modern day rape of the forest. Hacking to the database, hacking to the subconscious, the panel mark survival. Hacking to celebrity, hacking to the cultural development of taste. Hacking to violence, fear, and ignorance. How are they linked? Good afternoon, everyone. You want to come up? Uh, I think that that Josh and I decided we're gonna we're gonna talk a bit and intersperse it with a little bit of performance, if that's cool. We'll keep it moving, and maybe it'll raise new questions, and and, and we'll keep it moving like that. So. It's my pleasure to introduce. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just have to say that was really awesome, and it's so cool to have you at Google Soul. Thank you. Oh, oh, okay. It's excellent. Uh, so we have questions, lots right. of questions. Cool. So many questions, we had to edit them down quite a bit. All right. But I'd say the first thing is, your music, your poetry, is infused with social and political commentary, like nonstop. Mm -hmm. Technology is such a massive factor in that. Yeah. What is, it, what is it about online culture that you find interesting? It's just what I find interesting about culture. And art is a reflection of culture. And if I were not, if my, if my work did not reflect online culture, I don't know if I'd be significantly reflecting culture. Yeah. It's a huge part of who we are at this point. It's a huge part of how we operate, um, how we interact. Um, and, uh, and there's a lot of power yielded through that. Um, and then there are the powers that be. And I'm interested in the intersectionality between our individual power as human beings, uh, as communities, and as individuals, um, as is juxtaposed to um, the powers and power structures that, that aim to control uh, diffuse uh, our movement, or movements, for that matter. Um, so I, I don't consider myself an activist. I don't consider it a big deal that my work reflects shit that's going on in the world. I'm, I'm, I, I consider it more weird that there's so many songs about like strip clubs as if there's not other shit going on in the world. <laughs> you know, I think my shit is normal. <laughs> it's just like, okay, it's here's an overview of what I see going on. You know, I don't know why there aren't more like, you know, Chelsea Manning anthems, uh, you know, like to me it seems like, you know, yeah, why not? So. Yeah, so, so art is a big channel for social change, but so you're saying is like, you're not seeing much of that. Uh, there's a lot of it happening, and I think that, 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 you know, things move cyclically through different artistic genres. So that, for example, you know, if this were the 70s, maybe we'd be talking about film, and, or, and, and, and in the 90s, we'd be talking about independent film, and today we're talking about series, and there's a huge movement in visual arts that's happening right now. There's something going on in performing arts right now. Um, there's new avenues of digital arts that are occurring, so that it may not, you may not be witnessing certain things happening, let's say, in popular music. But you know, it's also interesting that the, the, the first people to suffer um, it, with the rise of technology and hacker culture and all this were like musicians. And what hackers don't fucking like music? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> but like, but you know, the, the music industry suffered, but musicians suffered as well, right? And, uh, and, and so we may be looking, you know, like if we look at popular music, maybe we can say, okay, maybe you don't see a lot of things addressing that, but that's popular music. If you look at underground movements in music, maybe you'll find more. Or, and maybe it's not the music. Maybe it's in visual arts where you're seeing it more. Maybe it's in graph, you know, the world of graphic novels, for example, is blowing up in America. You know, and there's a lot of like graphic artists that are that are approaching, you know, these topics that we might want to hear more of in music, but we're seeing it, you know, expressed in a different way. Who are some of the artists and like we talk about graphic artists and visual series, who are some of those artists that really inspire you? That inspire me? 
um, living. <laughs> so I'm inspired by a lot of dead people um, <laughs> that have been killed by the systematic, um, uh, <laughs> seriously. Um, <laughs> but um, who are people that are inspiring me? Uh, Gosh, I always go blank when that question is raised. Uh, there's, there's tons of people. I don't know. On one hand, I might say a visual artist like, let's say, Wengeshi Mutu or someone like Molly Crabapple or a writer like Warren Ellis. This is, you know, like when we're talking about graphic novel world, someone like Warren Ellis or... Uh, because I, I really love like the, the Trans Metropolitan series, for example. Um, I, I like uh, filmmakers, let's see. Um, there are weird people like, uh, I'm thinking of dead people, but there's people like um, Alan Gomez. If you want to help me, you can. Uh, <laughs> um, there are uh, people like, uh, I mean, I'm still also discovering, discovering, like roaming through references. So there's also people like Tarkovsky or, or, or Chris Marker, um, you know, that, that I, I, th I think that, you know, in the last poem, which was called Colton is Cotton, um, I, say, I talk about the, you know, taste and, and how the cultural signifiers of taste you know, and, and how we, uh, we have our references here. Tarantino, everybody, oh, Tarantino, what do you think of the latest Tarantino, you know? And uh, whereas, you know, maybe 20 years ago, everybody might have been like, you know, what do you think of the latest Cassavetes, or not? You know, I remember going to uh, Amoeba Music in, in LA and looking in the great directors section of their DVDs, and, and Cassavetes wasn't there. And I was there with someone from France who was like, how is Cassavetes not here when that is your greatest director? You know, <laughs> so that we have different references, right. you know, um, and ideas of what we think is great and, and how outsiders look and go, no, that's what's great about what you guys are, you know, creating or what have you. So I, I don't know. I don't know. But there's tons of people, but I, I can never think of them when asked. <laughs> <laughs> Your story reminds me of what we were talking about a little bit earlier about in Chicago, the old chess records mm -hmm. offices, how someone from France, who, a colleague of ours, um, stopped by. He wanted to see that place. And like for him, that was a huge cultural reference. Yeah. But in Chicago, it might be overlooked. Exactly. Or you, and, and, and so, yeah, in response to that, I said, you know, the Keith Richards book, who talks about how the Rolling Stones, he says it in like the first chapter of his book, where he's just like, we basically sold the blues back to Americans because they were too racist to accept it from the black people that created it. So we just sang blues songs and gave it back to them. But they were like, how the fuck are you not listening to this shit? Well, we'll just sing their songs or you know, riff off of their songs. Oh, and now you love it. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, we, th these references, but for them, in England, in their schools, listening to those Muddy Water or whatever, you know, Lightning Hopkins or what have, they, they're blown away by it blown away. And I'm also interested in that. I'm interested in the dialogue between cultures. I'm interested in how, you know, uh, 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 one blues singer named Pink and another blues singer named Floyd can inspire some kids, you know, in, in England, you know, to come out with a band. And, and there's this dialogue going on, or you think of Fela Kuti being in LA in 68 and hearing, you know, like Jim Morrison and, and Sly Stone and James Brown and going back and, and to, to Nigeria and creating this, this sound. Before that, he's making like jazz stuff and going back and creating this sound that is this fusion of this, you know, what became Afro pop, but you know, fused with this this soul funk and all this stuff. This dialogue between cultures, which happens way more easily now with uh, with with tech technology. You know, you see it a lot with e electronic artists and what have you. Um, and, or, although not as much as it could, you know, and 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 I don't think there's enough correspondence necessarily between. Um, between, like, for example, my current album, Marta Loser King, I'm really thinking a lot about, uh, or I was listening to a lot of traditional, like, folkways type recordings of, of traditional music that, that some of it, let's say, comes from the Great Lakes region of the continent of Africa, right? And what I'm interested in there is the minimalism and the polyrhythm, which juxtaposes itself in the music in such a way so that at some point you feel like you're listening to digital music. 
It's trance music. You're like, this is fucking trance. And, and, and it's totally, it starts to feel electronic. And you're like, holy shit. So that then the question of what is actually the most forward thinking or progressive sounding thing, you, you put that alongside some like EDM shit. And you're like, those guys are not doing shit, actually, except for the drop. <laughs> I respect the drop. And apparently but, uh, it sounds amazing <laughs> in cavernous Vegas nightclubs. Yeah, what I hear. you know, yeah. <laughs> so let's talk about Martin Luther King a little right. bit. Um, because we were talking about the tribal drumming and, and those polyrhythms and then fusing that with digital electronics, mm -hmm. it does have that trance-like sound. But as far as the story, it's a sprawling concept. Mm -hmm. Talk you, Some of your lyrics from the album or in the book USA. Yeah, like, uh, Colton I was Pop working on it at the same time, yeah. yeah. Uh, so tell us about Martin Luther King. What does that mean? Who is this character? Martin Luther King is the screen name of a hacker who lives in uh, Central Africa, in Burundi, actually. And, uh, and it's a guy who's hiding out in Burundi. And, and, and I chose this region because Essentially, this region, the Congo, Rwanda, Burundi, uh, is one of the spots where you find the largest collection of, of cobalt, Colton, you know? And, and what I find interesting about our reliance on these resources, the same way we have relied on rubber, titanium, you know, like the, the, the coffee, sugar, the, the, there's a long history of mining these regions, these, and, and, and exploitation, um, and, and, and juxtaposed with Western comfort, right? And the irony is that Colton is something that distributes power through small circuitry boards, right? Distributes power. So I'm thinking about the distribution of power, right, and the distribution of wealth and all these things and, and how and, and the blocks along the way. And for me, I, I found it interesting, and that's not this isn't necessarily what the the, the story is about, but I'm gonna, I'm saying this as an aside. What I find interesting is that so many of our tech, digital, virtual advances are so heavily reliant on analog exploitation. And I'm trying to figure out how we can make real advances. I'll count it as real when it doesn't involve analog exploitation. But my, what I mean by that is just old school, commonplace exploitation. You can imagine the story of what's happening around those mines, who owns them, the, the, you know, and just and, and all the like domino effect reactions of the bullshit surrounding that leading to us, <laughs> you know calling the next Uber. Um, so I have a village of hackers who live in a place that's called Marta Loser Kingdom. And where and they built this village they, uh, at this place, not, not at a Colton mine, actually. It's a bunch of like escapee miners who end up at an e-waste camp, which is where all of our, you know, digital shit, hardware goes to die. And so you have mounds of, of you know, motherboards and all this shit. And, but they arrive there, one guy arrives there like right at the cusp of rainy season. And the main thing that he needs is shelter. And so he ends up building the shack out of old computer parts. Other people see what's going on and end up, there's a village that's then built of old computer parts. The story is sci-fi. So there is a character that arrives who is a modem. And, uh, <laughs> and, and so it is the story, essentially, of what happens when this village connects. And it's also a story about how, um, because of, of uh, you know, the sort of like utility aligned with necessity and what have you, what happens when, you know, there's a character there in the story who creates a, uh, who, who, and these are taken from real stories, but who builds a 3D printing machine, for example, you know? And, and which is very necessary because in this story there are, there's all sorts of people needing all sorts of things, and so they're providing you know, anything from prosthetic limbs and all this stuff. So you have this kind of like almost cyborg community that is the most advanced tech hub on the planet actually, that no one knows about. That, and eventually, like, basically, he becomes like a virtual Banksy. 
At first, he's just doing some like kind of kind of gray hat sort of hacking shit that's that's just kind of funny, but you know it gains po gains in popularity and. Uh, and it gets a little crazy when he starts playing around with like that Amber Alert technology, <laughs> the shit that allows him to like choose a region and send a message to a bunch of people in a region. And, uh, and then it gets crazy when they hack into a satellite because then it's a question of, of security and defense. And so they go, he goes from virtual fame or notoriety to being labeled a terrorist. And, um, and what's funny is that their community is able to exist much longer than one would imagine because the Western intelligence sees the signal coming from there and is like, well, obviously somebody's throwing their signal. <laughs> There's no fucking way that this is coming from Burundi. And so it's also about that. Like, you'll never find us just because you're too arrogant to look at the source of where this shit is coming from, you know? So it's also about that. But yeah, Martin Luther King starts off as an individual, but then it becomes a title once Martin Luther King, the, the, the first one, is killed after being labeled a terrorist. Um, and then there's someone, another character named Neptune Frost, who is the Martin Luther King. And, uh, and, and so it's just about this hacker community, this anarchist group that influences uh, society as we know it through initially a bunch of like, funny hacks that's, you know, it's kind of like, I don't know, Gucci fur. You know, you guys know the hacker Gucci fur who like took George Bush's uh, emails and, and showed the world that he was painting and all this sort of stuff. And uh, I think Gucci fur, they're using Gucci fur now to, to try to incriminate Hillary Clinton. Yeah, yeah, they, they locked up Gucci fur. He was in, I forget where he was, Armenia or something? Hungary, I forget where, where this guy is actually from. Um, but yeah, he became sort of known, he got caught, and now they're trying to say, look, you know, uh, they use him. He's one of the, the locked up hackers who like makes these deals and, and like, okay, you have access to a computer if you can help us, blah, 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 blah. You know, and so it's, it's, it's about all of this stuff. It's about the whistleblowing stuff that's going on. It's about transparency. It's, it's about the tech wave of, you know, of the moment, um, but centered in the place where that is dependent, that, that this whole thing is dependent on in a sense, you know, and, uh, and it's really just a way for me to dump a lot of current issues like into my drum machine and and talk about them in, with the slight veil of fiction. Yeah. I know one of the tracks on the album, Ashes, I think you wrote that after it was Eric Garner mm -hmm. passed away. Um, so there are a lot of other factors that come into the record, again, like you were saying, like social. Well, yeah, 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 uh, exactly, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm definitely talking about everything from, I mean, with a story like that, I mean, it's, and, and then there's the character Neptune Frost, who, who is trans actually, who's from Uganda, where, where the anti-gay laws brought by American evangelicals, um, <laughs> uh, you know, are rampant. And so, yeah, the story allows me to talk about everything from feelings about the police to feelings about the militarization of, you know, of police forces, of, 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 of all of these things. Why don't I play a song real yeah, quick? Yeah, um, I want to do a song called The Noise Came From Here. Um, par, par, I'm not going to play the video, although I'll, I'll, I'm running software right now that a designer friend of mine named uh, Missy L. Leon, um, who's in Mexico, but, um, but created this software that we've taken on the road with us as we're touring, and he's, uh, and basically we're able to uh, feed it, I'm able to feed it text, images, um, which he glitches up and, and it randomizes as we go. So it's happening in, in real time as we're on stage, but, but yeah, it's interesting. So anyway, I, I wanna just do this song called The Noise Come From Here. You yeah. mentioned Ashes, maybe we'll get to think like the book say, but let me yeah, just do perfect. something really quick yeah. since we're, uh, it feels like the moment. Yeah, feels perfect. Right. Step off and let you do your thing. You don't have to step off if you sure. sing with me. Right. No, I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> you don't want to hear that. I trust. Trust me. <laughs> Woo! 
We won't be silenced, no, the noise came from here. You're never ending war, will not be waged from here. The future is my home, it all came from here. Police and sirens, guns are on parade right here. You never touch my love. Your bullets and your guns, you know we paid for it all. The scriptures severing tongues, you know we paid for it all. With all you land our blood, you know we paid for it all. We won't be silenced, no, you know we paid for it all. Your bullets and your guns, you know we paid for it all. With all you land our blood, you know we paid for it all. We won't be silenced, no, you know we paid for it all. You never touch my love. Guns, you know we paid for it all. The scriptures separate tongues, you know we paid for it all. With oil and our blood, you know we paid for it all. You never touch my love. This is the song Ashes we talked about. Dancing on the corpse's ashes. Dancing on the corpse's ashes. Dancing on the corpse's ashes. Dancing on. comes Lazarus, triangulating green god dear Pythagoras, equal to the sum of what the matter is, what the matter is, what the matter is, what the matter is, what's the matter? Some politician's pockets getting fatter, the Robert Moses of the useless chatter ignores the data, ignores the data, ignores the data, but he keeps building the wall between the poor and the rich building. Headquarters for the police worth a billion. They make a killing. Protect and serve. Your bullets won't deliver the last word. Police of the religions as absurd. Fuck the word. Heed the feeling. The calculated masses are appealing. The jury hung from every museum ceiling. History tries its best to keep us kneeling. We have come standing on a field of bankers' dung, extinguishing the fires of the young. We should have listened when the sirens rung, cause we found them dancing on the graves of the ones who had renowned them. And they couldn't give a fuck. All right. 
So check it out. Come back up here. Thanks. One, I didn't show the video because I wanted you guys to see some of this software, but uh, we have the director for the video from The Noise Came From Here, the first song I recorded, uh, performed um, here, Anisia Uziman. Um, and uh, that video, just to show some of how, uh, how we're connecting uh, you know, that story to global issues and what have you, we shot it in Ferguson. And we shot it around the, the area where Michael Brown's body was, you know, had laid for, for many hours, and there's now a memorial there. We shot it around that memorial. And uh, not simply there, uh, as you'll see if you check out the video. Um, but part of but the song itself um, uses a sample that comes from the Twa, which is uh, a group in, um, that's found in Rwanda and the, the, the Great Lakes region that's kind of, you know, somewhat disappeared in, many, in, in a similar way that, that a lot of Native Americans have been disappeared here in the States and, and in the Americas. Um, and, and, but you see, we're, we're taking sounds from there, electronic sounds, ideas that, that really, um, that are not just here, because when we talk about, you know, like there's that, that, there's that, that idea in, um, in the song Ashes, which followed, where, as you mentioned, it's, it's, it is partially a response to Aaron Garner. Uh, there's the lyric that I love, which is headquarters for the police worth a billion, because New York is building this billion dollar police headquarters. You know, they make a killing, is the statement. And, um, but the thing is, you know, it's not just in America. There's people in Haiti and the Congo around the world with the same, like, fuck the police sentiment. Um, I can say that in Google offices, right? Fuck the police, is that all right? And, um, and, so, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and, and so what's important for me is to realize that, you know, because a lot of times we, we get stuck in this binary sort of thinking where we think it's black and white, it's racism, but, but it's a question of power. It's a question of power, a question of authority. And, 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 and of course, when you talk about Google and these mega corporations and browsers and all this stuff and, and the authority that they begin to yield, even in a corporate, I mean, in a political climate in this day and age, it's important for us as, as people to also realize the power that we can wield in questioning authority and challenging authority. You know? And so for me, I'm, I'm just, just juxtaposing those worlds, trying to connect a few dots. I mean, that, that's pretty much the idea. The idea. And, and as is it expressed, for example, when you see uh, protesters in Ferguson being advised by, by people living in Gaza and in Palestine saying, oh, this is how you, you know, respond to tear gas. You know, like the, the sharing information and all that. There's, there's beautiful things that technology has allowed us to share. And, uh, and so I'm just trying to share some of those ideas through music and, and art and what have you. Yeah, yeah. technology can, as, as you mentioned, it can be a catalyst for social change. And you mentioned some things in the international community. And you've lived abroad. You've mm -hmm. lived in Paris. Uh, I think you've I lived, lived in Brazil. In, Brazil. Yeah. Um, in fact, one of our colleagues also noticed that in one of your other songs, you actually cut into Portuguese. Yeah, uh, think like they books say. <laughs> yeah. So, Having lived abroad, how does that affect your perceptions, and how have your perceptions as being an American changed? Well, I lived in Brazil when I was 16. I was an exchange student, and uh, I'm from New York, um, from a small city like 60 miles outside of New York called Newburgh, New York. And, um, and so I arrived there. I'm 16. I'm a junior in high school. I'm supposed to be there for a year. Um, I was there for a year. Um, the first thing that happens is I, uh, and I talk about this in the introduction to USA. I talk about how uh, I arrived there and, well, first, school is on strike. So I find out I'm not going to be going to school because the teachers are on strike, and that strike lasted for six months. In fact, I was an exchange student to Brazil, but I did not go to school while I lived in Brazil, <laughs> um, which is fine by me. And, uh, and then the other side of it was that if school were not on strike, um, as a 16-year-old, 
I would have had to go to night school because if you were 15 or older, it was expected that you would be working in the fields during the day. And so high school was only night school. And so me and my little, you know, public enemy and my headphones and all this shit is like, what? <laughs> you know, like just this crazy reaction so that suddenly I'm starting to realize. And, and, and so you juxtapose that with the fact that people, you know, like when school actually did start, by that time I had befriended the English teacher who was also my capoeira instructor. And, um, and so I went as an assistant, and I only went a few times because whenever I would go, school would just stop and everyone would gather around me and just be like, we have questions, we have questions, you know? And one of the first questions I was always asked, whatever city I visited was, is America really free? Is it free like in the movies, like we see in the movies? Is it really free? Is it free with sex? Is it free like we see in the movies? The other question I'd get asked was, uh, and this was all the time, what's it like to be sprayed with a fire hose? And I'd be like, oh, you mean my parents? <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> I have no idea. But I would always get asked this question because the images that were you know, diffused through media that they were getting were old. And so it's like, oh, a black guy from America. You, must know what that's, what's that like, you know? Um, and so what did it do to me to be, like how did that shift my perspective of America? Well, the best way I could answer that is by, is, is I remember my first trip to the supermarket and I was told by my host family, they're explaining to me like, everything that you'll find in the supermarket comes from no more than like 20 miles around this, you know, this place. And then I'm looking at the fruit, and there's like, you know, there's black on the bananas, and the oranges aren't as orange, and you know, I see all this kind of discolored stuff, but I'm from the States, so I'm like, oh, wow, I expected that. This is tropical, I thought this was gonna be, I taste it, and it's delicious. I'm like, but it's not, he's like, ah, oh. well, there's a farm over there that's owned by an American company, and they use these chemicals. And, but we don't use those on ours. And so if you're looking for the stuff that looks like your idea of an orange, your idea of that, that's over there where they use the chemicals. Here, in our supermarket, is just the real shit. Taste it. Like, oh, it's delicious. Good enough, huh? And so <laughs> those are the sort of things that I was like, oh. Oh, wow. Now, there's other side, right? The other side was that at the time when I lived there, there really was no middle class. And we hear that here with politicians all the time, like, we're, we're destroying our middle class and all this shit. But I lived with a family, this is in 1989, 1989 to 90. I lived with a Japanese family in Brazil, um, the largest like, demographic of, of, uh, of Japanese living outside of Japan is in Brazil. It's been that way for like 100 years. And uh, so I lived with a Japanese family there who owned sugar plantations in the north of Brazil. And they were oil rich because at that time, most cars in Brazil ran on ethanol, which came from sugar cane. Then. So also we have to remember, it's not about technology half the time. It's about these fucking lobbyists <laughs> who are trying to slow the you know, I mean, the first car was electric. The second one was biodiesel. You know, like it's, I mean, <laughs> for real, like we, we're, uh, it, it's not so much that, that technology has not allow, afforded us certain, it's, it's these corporations that have had this, exerted this control. So yeah, I was living with a family that was making oil, of, you know, making ethanol out of sugar cane. And, um, and in this beautiful house that was next door to people who lived with a dirt floor. And when I say there was no middle class, that's what I mean. I mean, like, literally next door, people had a dirt floor, and I'm in a house that had a green room, a green house in the middle of the house with birds living in the wall with the little microphones that they had little knobs around the house. If you wanted to have the tropical feel around the house, you could just turn up the knob in your room. 
my bedroom, <laughs> it's true, my bedroom, they had two other kids, and so, uh, and, and so the third bedroom was actually the, the house's music room where they had a stereo built into the wall. And that was my bedroom. And that may be why I'm here now, because living in that room, where I, which was soundproof, which I could shut the door and put on anything I want, turn it up as loud as I want, and the sound was literally coming from the walls, and I'd be jumping on the bed like fucking, like, out with no school. <laughs> you know, uh, yeah, it was fucking crazy. But, um, but in terms of America, uh, I learned a lot. I learned a lot. Another big lesson for me was, was traveling. At one point, I traveled for two months with, with 50 other exchange students from around the world and suddenly realized how stupid I was because all the kids from like Denmark, England, Australia, France, da -da -da, they'd be sitting there like, did you hear about what happened in Zimbabwe? Oh my God, da -da -da, I read about the thing that went down in Beirut. Da -da -da -da. All, they'd be talking about things, that global crises, right? Or just world events. And I was suddenly like, I, where is that? Oh, oh no, I, uh, uh. and I'm like, fuck, what are these? And not to mention the fact that most of them were speaking like two or three different languages and speaking in English for my sake, right? Or we could all speak Portuguese. So I suddenly had this insight into, because I was a good student, but I realized that regardless of how good of a student I was, what I was learning in the American system was not really preparing me to sit at a table with a bunch of other 16-year-old kids from around the world and not feel like a total fucking ignoramus, just like, nothing to say. Uh, you know, like, have you heard the new Kanye yet? <laughs> like, I just, I, I had nothing to contribute. <laughs> you know, I could talk about, I, I, because my family was activists, I could talk about what was happening in South Africa. And that was funny. Not funny. But it was funny because there was an Afrikaner kid there who, who was in total denial and had no idea what was going on in the country where he was from. And so I was like, what about the 4,000 kids being held in detention? I knew because my sister was an activist and we had been boycotting companies like Coca-Cola and all this shit in my house in New York. And he was like, there are no kids being held in. No, the blacks are treated fairly in South Africa. And uh, which reminded me of a lot of Americans I see abroad who are totally unaware of what's actually happening here. So that's, uh, <laughs> that's a long form answer of, of what I picked up. We could probably go a while on that one just alone. <laughs> so as much as people were flocking around you asking you questions when you were in Brazil, I think there's probably some Googlers here who might have some questions. Let's do it. So we have some mics here on the side. If you do have any questions in the audience, um, please step up. Um, and also, just uh, so you're aware, we have some books in the back. We have also a handful of vinyl records. So if you have a turntable and you're going to listen to the record, please pick one up. How's it going? Super. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about um, when you, uh, so the f first time I discovered you was from uh, the Nike commercial. And I, and I was like, this is an amazing song. You know, I need to find out who this is. Um, and so it was listed of demands. And I, I, I'm just curious how you feel. Like, um, I'm obviously getting, I don't know you that well, but I definitely get kind of a little bit of like a, a subculture, not, not really trying to be mainstream. Um, how you kind of find, you know, would you participate in additional commercials? How do you kind of feel about that looking back? Um, and like, uh, you know, just, just about commercialism and, you know, how you get yourself out there. Sure. I would, never would have discovered you if I hadn't heard you on that commercial. Just kind of that juxtaposition. Well, cool. It's true that I'm really into subcultures. It's not true that I have no interest in the mainstream. I'm interested in shifting what the mainstream is about. And through observation, I realize that things go in cycles, you know? Like, what's have been, what has been of interest to me is taking periphery ideas and periphery arts and seeing how far I can push them into the mainstream. I mean, for example, most of you guys have heard of slam poetry at this point. And in 1996, when I first started participating in that, and 98, when I came out with my film Slam, the idea was not to avoid the mainstream, it was to take these ideas and these poems and say, what happens if this is the type of shit that becomes the mainstream? So I've been more aligned with the idea of how do we re-envision 
the mainstream. Because I, like anybody else, I sit back and go, wow, Jimi Hendrix was once mainstream. Bob Dylan was once mainstream. That shit was mainstream. When can that happen again? You know, so it's really about pushing the mainstream. So that basically what I discovered early on, way before the Nike commercial, because um, I wrote that song in 2004, that c Nike commercial came out in 2008, um, was that if I, so that I, I basically started dealing with thinking of poetry as coding and, and, and thinking of how could I embed my work with something so that regardless of how you encountered it, you would walk away with those things that made you go look it up and go, Ooh, what's that about? I want to, blah, 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 you know? Which is why I, I've never had any issues about my music appearing in any commercial or whatever. As I said at the time when I was confronted about it, I was like, I don't really feel like I did a Nike commercial. I feel like Nike just did a Soul Williams commercial. <laughs> you know? Yeah. That was the idea. Because I, I, I essentially felt like, it's not like you watch the commercial and you're like, oh my God, I got to get those shoes. You know? Like, good luck selling your shoes. We all buy that shit anyway. <laughs> right? We all buy it anyway. But you would watch it and go, what is that song? What is that? And that wormhole that that would lead you through, through poets, other writers, other references, before you know it, you're in the subculture that I've been trying to introduce you to, which has to do with the collection of amazing artists and friends and all the things that we're talking about, diversity, intersectionality, is the shit that was happening in the open mics in the 90s. You're welcome. You understand what I'm saying? That's, essentially, that's been the plan, is how do we embed our work with the type of shit that makes these guys at Wyden Kennedy or whatever go, this song is really cool. <laughs> <laughs> like, glad you like it. Because <laughs> also, yeah, we need to eat and all that shit. I mean, and, and my background is in theater. Um, I started writing poetry when I was in the grad acting program at NYU. I've never been like, oh my God, I don't want to be in the mainstream. I've just looked at a lot of shit in the mainstream and been like, that's corny as fuck. Or worse yet, that's negligent. Why would you put that message out there? Why would you do that? So when I had the opportunity to write my first film and act in it, which was, which was my thesis project at NYU, the film Slam, um, my first thought was, OK, more than likely, this is going to reach the mainstream. What do I want to? What do I want to put out there? So every little message, every idea, every T-shirt I'm wearing, all the shit is like, let's put this shit in the mainstream. Let's see if we can get that in the mainstream. When I had the opportunity after that to do my first album with Rick Rubin, Amethyst Rockstar, the idea was the same thing. It was just like, OK, it's Rick Rubin. This might reach the mainstream. It's never been about the idea of like avoid the mainstream, avoid conforming to the idea of, of the, the, the fact that you would think that you need to conform in order to reach it. That's what I'm avoiding, is, is conforming. Not progressing and evolving on ideas, but conforming for the sake of reaching the mainstream. That is what uh, I'm against. That's what's whack to me, you know? Cool. Okay. Oh, thanks. So in a lot of your travels, you've been throughout Europe. I, I know you just mentioned you just got back. What you're starting to see a lot of times is free speech coming under uh, a lot of pressure. And you see cartoonists or journalists who are being persecuted against or silenced. And I was wondering, have you, as an artist and an activist, have you ever been attempted to be silenced or even successfully silenced on a certain topic or area? And I was wondering if you can talk a little more on that. The only silencing that I've experienced is whatever silencing occurs that makes some of you in this room not hear of me until today. My work has been in enough platforms, but there are those who hear my work and go, maybe not this platform. <laughs> you know? Otherwise, I can't, I mean, yes, there's always been moments like, for example, here's a funny backstory. The idea for Marta Luther King actually came about when Nickelodeon asked me if I could write a few poems for Black History Month. 
<laughs> and I wrote, and, and I, some of those poems are in the book USA, actually, right? And, uh, and one of the, the poems I'd written after hearing someone mispronounce the name Martin Luther King, a, a Francophone person, and, uh, was I started writing this poem thinking about a kid who comes home from school, like, I heard about this great guy today named Martin Luther King, and, you know, and, 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 and talking about, and he wanted to name his dog that, right? And, uh, and, and Nickelodeon was like, this is not, <laughs> I didn't feel silenced. I knew I was pushing it anyway. That's what I'm into. I'm trying to push and see, like, how, well, how far can we go? How far can we go? <laughs> you know? But, um, but I, don't, I can't say that I have felt uh, silenced by, by certain forces. But of course, you know, there's, there's, I walk into tons of places that are like, I mean, because for me, it's, it's, it's the most minimalistic thing. You, if, you, if I'm on the radio where I can't curse, I already feel silenced. You know, I'm already like, what the fuck? <laughs> you know, <laughs> like, what year is this? What's up with our pure? You know, because you go to Europe, for example, and you hear all of the songs that's on American radio without any of the beeps or, or whatever, and you're just like, oh, that's what they're saying. Mm -hmm. I mean, you knew it, but you never heard them say it before unless you're in a club. But it's all on the radio there, and it's all like nigger ass, ho, bitch, bit blah, blah, and you're like, fucking hell, and the kids are like, I love American music, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and, and, but they don't have the same Puritan strain as us, you know? And, uh, and I think that, gets in the way of, of, of moving the, the dialogue forward. And, and I'm not the first to have that complaint. I mean, Allen Ginsberg said a great deal about that same sort of censorship that he encountered. But no, I can't say that I feel silenced. But like I said, I do feel like some people might be afraid or corporations or whatever might be afraid to work with me. But I've never been like, I have to make it clear, I've never really been afraid of corporate culture. Like, Slam came out through Trimark Cinema. I have five books that came out through MTV Books. You know, my albums have come out through Sony and all that. No, I, I, I'm an independent artist here because of who I am. I'm an independent artist. But I interact with these motherfuckers all the time. I love playing with the sharks. It's fun. <laughs> you know, it's fun. All right, well, speaking of silence, I think we only have just a couple minutes left. I think we might have time for one more question. So, so speaking of playing with sharks, where do you draw the line? Or is there a line for folks you wouldn't work with or interact with or oh, entities you wouldn't? I was curious what that line is. Right. Um, well, you know, I'm working on this new uh, program with Monsanto right now. I'm joking. <laughs> um, and, <laughs> you know, I'm trying to help Whole Foods find higher pricing um, <laughs> in poorer neighborhoods. Um, no, I mean, I, I kind of take it as it comes. I'm not sure, you know? I, like I said, I. I make my living writing poetry. I'm excited about prospects of, of actually being able to earn occasionally. You know, like I'm paid by stanza. Um, it's, <laughs> it's uh, I think, I, I, I play it by ear. It, 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 it really, I mean, I have drawn lines before. I remember once years ago being asked, and then the other, well, let me finish that idea. I remember being asked years ago to write a poem about a new Mercedes for a Mercedes radio campaign. And I actually never liked Mercedes. I was always, as a kid, it was like Michael Prince, Mercedes Volvo. When I was like, Volvo. <laughs> they're more hardcore, warm seats, they're, they're square. You know, <laughs> I like Volvo, I don't know. So I was like, I'm not doing it. But then I did something for Levi's, not right for it. And then the other thing, like, even with the Nike thing, I was like, I don't think I could do it if they asked me to write something for it. But if you want to take one of my existing works and apply it, I might be open. You know? And so that's, so there's, it always depends on what it is. You know? Like, there was a, at one point I was, this is before the 
the holler if you hear me play that I did years before that, I was in communication with uh, Tupac Shakur's mom as she was planning something that was kind of like American Idol with poetry. And it was going to go across the states, and, and there were going to be all these poets, and it was going to be televised. But she was teaming with Burger King. And, so one, and they wanted me to be the host. And I had to be open to the possibility of my poems being on the side of Burger King, like drinking containers. And I was like, that's where I draw the line. <laughs> I just couldn't, I couldn't, I, I just couldn't imagine. I was like, no, that's just not cool. So it's just, it depends. It, it really depends, you know? But I actually have done a lot of stuff where I'm like, that's cool. Yeah, it works. I, the most surprising thing for me, and, and I guess the freest form of, of interaction with, with the corporate world for me has come in the sports world. Because as I'm making this stuff like for the revolution, other people are like, your music's really great to run to. <laughs> you know, it's great for working to you. I meet football players, you're like, yo, man, we work out to your shit, man. I'm like, oh, I didn't think about that. You know, and so I've done tons of stuff with like Nike, Puma, like with Adidas, with all this shit. I'm like, oh, wow, I didn't think about sports. And I'm always open to that shit, you know, so it, it depends. Well, I think we're over time. I think Sorry, we've, I knew it was uh, going to happen. We, we've reached the end, but uh, it's been a fascinating talk, and your performance was incredible. And we're so glad we have some records and some books uh, to give out to Googlers. Do you mind sticking around just for a few minutes as well? I'm fine. I'm here. Awesome. Cool. All right. Well, again, thanks, Saul Williams, for joining us at Google. Thank you, guys, for having me. Thank Absolutely. You.